The next item of business is the debate on motion number 2099, the name of Keith Brown, on delivering future enterprise and skills support in Scotland. Phase one outputs from the enterprise and skills reviews. Can I ask, uh, I call on Keith Brown, I beg your pardon, can I ask members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Keith Brown to speak and move the motion. 13 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Yesterday, I published the phase one decisions of the enterprise and skills review. Uh, the First Minister had announced the review in this chamber five months ago to the day. Our aim was to take fresh action towards our long-term ambition encapsulated in Scotland's economic strategy to rank in the top quartile of OECD countries for productivity, equality, well-being and sustainability. This ambition is the foundation for the work of our four enterprise and skills agencies, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council, both individually and together with each other and the Scottish Government. We recognise the vital contribution the four agencies make to creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through delivering inclusive and sustainable economic growth. Our long-term ambition will require our best intelligence, analysis and creative ideas to achieve it. The first phase of the review has been about reaching out, offering opportunities to be involved and collecting the evidence to ensure a simpler system based on the needs of users and delivering the right outcomes for everyone. We've engaged extensively over the summer and gathered evidence in many forms, from economic advisors and academics, from individuals, businesses, further and higher education institutions, agencies and representative organisations. And we've sought the views of people with, ex with experience of using these public services. In particular, I'd like to thank all members of the Ministerial Review Group for their valuable insight and support. We also looked again at Audit Scotland reports and Graham Reid's report into innovation centres hot off the press. For my part, I was very encouraged by the high level of engagement with our national ambition and the quality and the wide range of responses from individuals, businesses and organisations with good ideas about how best to come together to achieve our ambitions. And I'd wish to thank all those who have engaged so far. This balance of views is crucial to seeing the challenges in context and to finding the right answers. Some asked for a refreshed strategic focus, a single vision, goals and shared ownership, Others want to understand the criteria for support and a simple to access, uncluttered service. Uh, many respondents presenting us have conveyed a sense of being excited and energised by this process, enabling us to develop at real pace. Which is not to say that we have rushed this consideration. Some of our questions related to long-standing structures, so we have sought a careful balance between engaging with pace and deliberating carefully. Uh, last month, I announced that the review will proceed in two phases. Yesterday, we announced our top level actions and those areas where work is ongoing or further consultation is required. And we do want to work with others across the chamber and across Scotland. Interestingly, one of the major points made by the various business organisations on the ministerial review group was to see some political consensus to get behind what was subsequently agreed. So we want to work with others across the chamber in order to change that or make that transformational change in Scotland's economic performance. We also want to reinvigorate our focus and place our ambition firmly within the context of Scotland's economic strategy. So we seek to create an enterprise and skills system with strong leadership aligned closely behind our common purpose and meet the needs of the end users of these services. The excellent work of our agencies uh, already do much of this work. The agencies and their staff already carry out that work on behalf of a diverse range of individuals and businesses across Scotland. As Audit Scotland noted, they've been successful in their respective roles with clear strategies and with good governance. The enterprise agencies, for example, collectively work with or assist around 11,200 businesses each year. And there are good examples of all of them working with partners to achieve a positive impact, such as creating jobs. However, we have to acknowledge that good as they are, we need to step up our performance in order to achieve our ambition. And that level of challenge which we face has been increased exponentially with the EU referendum result, creating a new context that requires fresh urgency. In the lead-up to the EU referendum, the Scottish economy continued to grow and demonstrate resilience in the face of continuing external headwinds. Uh, I will do. Willie Rennie. I'm intrigued about proposals for Highlands and Islands Enterprise, but also for the south of Scotland. Will there be any changes to the functions of Highlands and Islands Enterprise and will there be a separate agency for the south of Scotland or is it just a local office? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say I do intend to come on to that, but in relation to uh, the functions, that will be part of what's considered in phase two. And in relation to the south of Scotland, it will be an agency that's established in the south of Scotland. Uh, Scotland's economy has grown modestly since the start of 2016, growing 0.4% in the three months leading up to the referendum, the highest rate of quarterly growth since the start of 2015. And can I say, in relation to some comments I've seen in newspapers from uh, both Andrew Dunlop um, and David uh, Mundell, the idea that uh, the Tory tactic of saying, well, we're not as good as the rest of the UK, uh, it seems to me to be a bizarre one. There are two governments involved in the economy of Scotland. And to absent yourself from being involved in the economy doesn't seem to be a commendation uh, for that approach. And also to say that if, as has been said by Andrew Dunlop, that the economy is not performing as well as the rest of the UK, so when the Scottish Government gets these new powers, we have to improve things. Why has it not been improved up till now when the UK yeah. Government has been exercising those powers? It seems to me to be a, a, a bizarre tactic. And also, I have to say I'm extremely surprised that the Conservative Amendment seeks to take out any reference to Brexit in the motion. I mean, we hear of Brexiteers and anti-Brexiteers, but we've not yet heard of Brexit deniers. Brexit is a huge issue in relation to these, uh, these points. The labour market, just to come back to that point, which was uh, the one that gave rise to Andrew Dunlop's comments, the labour market has continued to perform strongly, one of the lowest levels of unemployment that most of us have seen in perhaps a quarter of a century. As of August this year, employment levels were higher than they were a year ago. The unemployment rate in Scotland has fallen to 4.6%, its lowest rate in eight years, and lower than the UK's rate of 4.9%. So it is encouraging that the underlying resilience of the Scottish economy remains strong, and there is much to be positive about. However, over the next 18 months, the outlook for growth in Scotland and the UK has weakened following the referendum. Economic forecasters have downgraded their growth projections for 2016 and more substantially for 2017 to reflect the heightened risk of a reduction in economic activity as the post-referendum political process unfolds. At longer term, we also know that independent economic forecasts point to a range of possible impacts for the economy from a redefined relationship within the EU. While the path ahead, of course, is uncertain, the Scottish Government, though, it's clear that Scotland's relationship with the EU and our place in the single market must be protected. That is vital for Scotland's businesses and investors in ensuring Scotland's business environment remains stable and attractive for investment. And just to mention, on Monday of this week, I was in Ayrshire talking to a number of companies, one of whom told me that their input prices, the material they source, the glass they source from Ireland is facing a 15% increase. And I'm hearing, I don't know about uh, other members, but I'm hearing this from a number of companies around the country facing huge increases in their input costs. In this general context, the Phase 1 report sets out our vision, our guiding principles and our actions under seven themes. We will strengthen the governance of our single enterprise and skill system, ensure appropriate regional approaches and take action on internationalisation, innovation, skills, digital, enterprise support and the circular economy. Evidence around governance advocated that we optimise what can be achieved by working seamlessly across the enterprise and skills system. Some of our respondents suggested a lack of clarity on roles and responsibilities, which in turn could lead to duplication. Users have asked us to simplify service delivery and to streamline funding schemes and grants, and respondents also said that alignment, hard alignment around the national ambition might be overseen by a single board to ensure enhanced collaboration. So we will provide stronger governance of this single coherent system by creating a statutory overarching board and ensure robust evaluation, develop co common targets, uh, uh, just a second, aligned with the national performance framework and economic strategy to aid that performance. I'll give way. Daniel Johnson. Presiding officer, I, I mean, I, I agree with the minister in one sense that streamlining the system is, is absolutely important for business. It's the, the one overriding cry that you hear from business organisations. But beyond creation of single board, could the minister please point to where else these, this streamlining is going to take place? Because it's far from clear for me uh, in reading this document that there's any other steps in this that will promote the streamlining of the organisations. Indeed, there's going to be more agencies that rather than less. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I don't think that's the case, not least by uh, uh, creating one single overarching board. Um, it's also true to say, if you do read the document, you'll see that the issue of decluttering, if you like, a, a fairly cluttered landscape just now will be taken forward in phase two. And he will know from the hustings that we both shared prior to the election, some of the exasperations which end users feel, and this is what this is trying to address. So 
Evidence on national and local uh, basis noted that arrangements should respond to differing opportunities and challenges across Scotland and a one-size-fits-all approach is inflexible. Users have told us that services and funding uh, streams might be simplified and highlighted the particular needs facing dispersed populations, both in the Highlands and Islands and the south of Scotland. So we'll back our more national approach with enhanced regional skills delivery, two integrated sides of the same coin, and we'll protect levels of service provision in the Highlands and Islands, and also create a new vehicle, as I've mentioned, to meet the enterprise and skill need, skills needs of the south of Scotland. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Just I can give you a little bit extra. Uh, in which case, yes, happy to give way. I'm Tavis very Scott. grateful to uh, the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. On his point about a single board, will uh, strategic decisions about the Highlands and Islands still be taken in Inverness or will they be taken by the new strategic board that he's just mentioned? Cabinet Secretary. To oversee the strategy, but also to provide that level of collaboration which both we and the respondents to the uh, consultation felt was not currently there. But the agency itself, Highlands and Islands, will remain in place uh, as stated in the phase one uh, outcomes. And we will also review with our local government partners the best way to work together to deliver flexible local services with better outcomes for the user. There should be scope for the government, local government, the agencies and other partners to work flexibly with emerging city deals, for example, as well as local services and regional economic partnerships. On internationalisation, evidence identified Scotland's wide range of international assets and strengths, but it suggested we could benefit from broader action across a wider range of activities, better coordination. This goes back to... Yes, well, yes. Dean Locker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I I'm quite interested that you haven't touched on productivity yet, and uh, the SNP's um, target of Scotland to reach the top quartile of productivity levels by 2017 has clearly not been met. Will there be a new announcement uh, either today or in, in the near future in terms of what the SNP's new target for productivity will be going forward? Because currently Scotland's in the third quartile of productivity. Cabinet Secretary. I just wonder whether members had the chance actually to read the phase one report which covers exactly this ground. Actually we've seen an increase of 4% in productivity in Scotland where it's been absolutely static in the UK. Nevertheless, I do recognise there is an issue which is what this review is seeking to address, both productivity, competitiveness and increasing exports. So this is, being, this is our proposal for how we help to address uh, those issues and internationalisation is one part of that. So we'll increase our pace on delivering our international trade and investment strategy, coordinate international activity across the public, academic and industrial sectors more strongly. We receive substantial um, responses suggesting that sometimes this effort had been duplicated in the past and one effort can always undermine another if you, unless you take, as is the case for example in the Republic of Ireland, very effectively a Team Scotland approach, in their case obviously a Team Ireland approach. Uh, but these issues we further considered, as I've mentioned, in Phase 2, including the role, the position and the governance of SDI. Uh, evidence around innovation also showed perceptions of complexity and asked what we, uh, that we simplify and streamline funding. Agencies should offer agile, fast and flexible interventions and collaborate better. So, for example, the Can Do Forum and the Council of Economic Advisers also identified these issues. So we will review, we will streamline and we will simplify innovation support programmes, funding and delivery mechanisms and we will bring into one forum the strategic decision making on innovation and publish the Innovation Action Plan by the end of November. In relation to skills, our recently published labour market strategy defines the labour market outcomes required to support inclusive economic growth. These will guide our approach uh, moving forward. And evidence also suggested that skills investment plans and regional skills assessments should be built, built upon to be better meet the needs of businesses and workers. Uh, labour market information should be used more extensively to inform the alignment of provision with labour market demand. Some advocated a regional approach and some questioned the balance of academic and vocational skills investment. We were also encouraged to consider the needs for reskilling across the workforce, including upper age ranges. So we'll align the functions of our skills agencies to better join up the way learning and skills are planned and provided for uh, learners and for their employers. We'll review our investment in learning and skills, including skills utilisation and also the learning journey into employment for young people. And we'll seek to support those with low skills already in the workforce and develop the skills of older workers to maximise productivity and inclusive growth. Evidence also highlighted how much our global economic competitiveness depends on the right digital approach. So we'll seek early improvements in services with a step change in digital skills provision at both general and specialist levels so that businesses compete, uh, can compete internationally. And we'll better communicate our infrastructure plans and continue to examine how best to accelerate improved coverage to ensure good connectivity across all of Scotland. 
and evidence on enterprise support suggested we have broadly the right strategic framework, but there could be areas for operational improvements. So we'll ensure a broader support offering to more companies on innovation, productivity, digital and exporting. We'll also seek to implement better targeting to increase impact and clearer entry and exit points for support. I will engage more closely with the private sector in shaping service delivery and will also consider where the private sector might be involved in, in providing services. Uh, presiding officer, I believe these decisions and this review will help us to achieve our strategic outcomes for Scotland and I would commend them to the Chamber. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, I now, now call Dean Lockhart to speak to and move Amendment 2099.1. Eight minutes, please, Mr Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We welcome the opportunity to discuss the future enterprise and skills framework in Scotland, and we also welcome the Scottish Government's Phase 1 report in this area. In particular, it was good to see the report including a number of Scottish Conservative proposals, including the establishment of a new enterprise body for the south of Scotland and the much-needed expansion of the uh, Scottish Development International Network. After almost 10 years in power and with no new policy initiatives, it's not surprising that the SNP is now looking to the Scottish Conservatives for new ideas on the economy. It was also encouraging to see that so many organisations took part in the call for evidence. As Mr Brown said, over 300 responses to the review. There was one overarching point I think that was made very clear from the feedback, and that is that enterprise and skills policies should not be viewed in isolation. As CBI Scotland has highlighted, and indeed Mr Brown mentioned today, Scotland's long-term economic plan needs to involve a joined-up approach between the Scottish Government's economic strategy on the one hand and the work of the enterprise and the skills agencies on, on the other. This point was also made clear by Audit Scotland, which said that the enterprise bodies are performing well, but the Scottish Government needs a clearer plan for delivering its economic strategy. Presiding officer, this feedback reflects what the Scottish Conservatives have been saying for a number of years, that this, the SNP's economic policy is not working for Scotland. It has become increasingly clear that the SNP's economic development strategy, based on the four I's, inclusive growth, innovation, internationalisation and investment, as reaffirmed by the Cabinet Secretary in this report, is not proving effective. For example, if you look at inclusive growth, the policy. There has in fact been very little growth in the Scottish economy in the past year, or indeed in the past decade. The latest GDP figures released two weeks ago show that the Scottish economy has expanded by only 0.7% in the past year, compared to 2.1% in the rest of the UK. Yes, yeah, sure. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Dean Lockhart for taking the intervention? And just to refer back to the previous point I made and the point that he just made, does he recognise the responsibility on the part of the UK government in the situation that he describes? Or does he, like Andrew Dunlop and David Mundell, always want to put it to the Scottish government, forgetting the role they are meant to have, the Conservatives, the UK government in the Scottish economy? Mr Lockhart. Well, Mr Brown, what I would say is that the, the SNP have had their hands on the levers of the economy for almost a decade. Almost a decade. You, 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 know, the, you, you had a review of the enterprise agencies when you first came to power in 2007, and you've now, you've now uh, had another end-to-end -end review. So I think you've had enough time to establish your economic credentials, and the economic data isn't very promising uh, on your side. So this... Um, this increasing economic divergence compared to the rest of the UK because of the additional powers requested by the SNP will have a direct impact on the Scottish budget and the amounts available to spend on education, enterprise and skills agencies and other elements of economic development going forward. And the other area I would highlight is innovation and productivity. The SNP has failed to meet its target for Scotland to reach the top quartile of productivity levels of OECD nations by 2017. And I asked Mr Brown, when will a new performance target be announced? Because according to Scottish Enterprise, if Scotland's productivity matched countries in the top quartile as set out in your target, Scotland's GDP would be boosted by £45 billion a year. That is an economic gain that is a multiple of any potential downside of Brexit. £45 billion a year if you had met your target. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will the SNP and perhaps the Minister will, in wrapping up, will tell us when a new productivity target for Scotland will be announced? Presiding Officer, given these failures in economic and business development policies, I call on the SNP to include in phase two of their report 
a detailed assessment of how it will address these ongoing economic policy failures and also set out specific steps to increase economic growth in Scotland and productivity in the Scottish economy. I think you've had the chance to do the phase one report. I think it's now time in the phase two report to have a more fundamental look at the Scottish economy and how you can boost uh, economic performance in the Scottish economy. Uh, presiding officer, turning to the, the detailed recommendations set out in the phase one report, we do agree with a number of the recommendations. Uh, we do have some concern that the proposed new Board of Trade may lead to further centralisation of economic policy and we will be monitoring how that will work in practice. Uh, we would also go further than some of the steps suggested by the SNP in order to meet the challenges faced by the Scottish economy. On enterprise policy, for example, our priorities are as follows. We need to simplify the enterprise support available for new and expanding businesses in Scotland. In the business community, there is real confusion over what form of assistance is available. In the economy committee yesterday, we, we heard that there is over 600 funding streams available to businesses in Scotland. That is simply uh, uh, a cluttered landscape that needs to be fixed. We would propose making available a one-stop digital portal with business development information broken, do broken down according to sector, regions, the size of business, and different business support for exporting companies and domestic markets. This is an approach that other countries such as Singapore takes, and it works very effectively. So I would recommend that to the government. Secondly, the enterprise agency agencies should provide more non-financial support in many cases, what is holding back the development of small business is the lack of management capacity or experience. Again, the Singapore or, or, or the, the model in, in Denmark shows that the secondment of sector experts into small and emerging businesses for a short period can result in exponential benefits. Third, we would encourage the government to designate some of the underperforming parts of Scotland as turnaround zones. This was part of our manifesto with special tax breaks, faster planning, streamlined regulation, and dedicated support for those who decide to set up in those areas. Again, this has worked in other countries, and there is evidence to show that it would work in Scotland. We also need to maximize the commercialization of innovation uh, with our coming from our world-class universities. Um, the work of the technology transfer offices needs to be looked at. This, this issue is um, not covered by the phase one report. I would uh, recommend it is covered by the phase two report because the technology transfer offices uh, are an essential part of the transition mechanism that translates innovation from universities into the commercial market and more can be done to maximize on the research that takes place in our world-class universities. <coughs> on skills development policy, there are a number of specific steps that we would suggest the Scottish Government should look at. Um, I was interested to see that there's very little mention of the apprenticeship levy and what uh, the plans are uh, in phase one. Perhaps that will be touched on if, on phase two. Uh, we need in Scotland to increase the levels of apprenticeship uptake in Scotland. Uh, per head of population, Scotland has only one half of the number of, of apprenticeships compared to the rest of the UK. We also need to clarify how the apprenticeship levy will be implemented in Scotland. The Scottish uh, Conservative approach will be to make sure that the application and destination of apprenticeship levy funds is fully transparent and that these funds will be reinvested in Scotland for apprenticeships and skills training and they will not be absorbed or lost in general funding. We also need to address the ongoing skills gap in Scotland. The recent CBI Scotland report has highlighted an increasing skills gap in the economy, and the CBI has recommended that future skills required in the economy should be driven by joint consultations between business and the skills agencies such as SDS. Uh, presiding officer, to conclude, the Scottish Conservatives will al always support measures which encourage enterprise and skills development, and we agree with a number of the measures set out in the Phase 1 report. However, given the ongoing underperformance of the Scottish economy, we call on the Scottish Government to include in Phase 2 of the report a detailed assessment of how it will address the ongoing underperformance of the Scottish economy and set out specific and real steps to increase economic growth and productivity in the Scottish economy. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. 
I now call Richard Leonard to speak to and move Amendment 2099.3. Mr Leonard, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be putting forward the Labour case and the Labour amendment to the Government's motion uh, this afternoon. And I want to begin, uh, and I shall end, with the recent Audit Scotland report into Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, because it reminds us, and I think this Parliament needs to be reminded, that between 2008 and 2015, the very years that our economy needed additional support, not less, the National Enterprise Agencies of Scotland had their budgets drastically cut. For Scottish Enterprise, for Scottish Enterprise, it was a cut of 16%, 16% in real terms. For the Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the core operational budget of high was cut by 22%, nearly a quarter over that same time period, according to Audit Scotland. Now, if we want, as I believe we do want, indeed, as the Scottish Government itself spells out in the motion before us this afternoon, to match other advanced industrial economies in our industrial investment, in our skills training and education, if we want growth and development, not simply care and maintenance, if we demand, as I believe we must demand, transformative change in our economy and a rebalancing of our economy with a vibrant manufacturing base, then the Scottish Government needs to be bold and ambitious. Because the well-respected Fraser of Allender Institute describes the current state of the Scottish economy not as strong, but, and I quote, as fragile. They forecast Scottish unemployment will rise to 7% next year. Production and manufacturing, as we hold this debate this afternoon, is not growing, it's contracting. Business investment, as measured by gross fixed capital formation, fell by 4% in the first quarter of 2016. That's according to the Scottish Government's own figures. And that's before Brexit. So with an already shrinking productive base, a downturn in industrial investment, with real unemployment already at 12%, with Brexit looming, this is no time. This is no time for business as usual, for timidity and tinkering with governance. This is not the occasion for postponing the real change we need, quite the opposite. It is precisely the moment for getting on with the real change that we need. We, needed a, we need a debate, but it needs to be a fundamental debate on our whole approach to economic development, training and education. We need a discussion, but we need an honest discussion about whether the current institutional framework is capable, capable of delivering the industrial strategy we need. Because I say this to the Cabinet Secretary, we heard the First Minister announce to her party's conference a plan to double the number of staff pursuing inward investment, to send out trade envoys from this new Scottish Board of Trade and to open up a new Scottish office in Berlin, which is, we suspect, necessary, but by no means sufficient for the Brexit challenge we face. So I say this to the Cabinet Secretary, it's high time we started building up our indigenous business base, especially in high value, high skill manufacturing industry. It is high time that we started developing the untapped potential for cooperative ownership growth in Scotland. The home of Robert Owen and the Fenwick Weavers should set itself the noble ambition of becoming a cooperative capital once more the Mondragon of the North. It is high time. It's high time we started to consider the innovative role which workers' pension funds, including public sector pension funds, could play in starting to advance popular economic ownership and control. It is high time, too, that we seriously consider the case for greater public ownership of public transport, of renewable energy, of local government services and nationally organised services like the work programme. I would go further and say to the Cabinet Secretary that it is high time, as part of a coherent strategy for industry, that he started to look at new economic planning agreements and public equity stakes to stimulate the wider economy too. Because I am firmly of the view that change will not come about if we simply leave it to the market. It requires government leadership. It demands a considered, coherent, credible industrial policy and strategy and that policy and strategy needs to lie at the heart 
of the Scottish Government, not as an afterthought. It demands a long-term vision of what we want our economy to look like in 20 years' time, because the change we need will not happen overnight, but we need to make a start now to make progress in the right direction. And that's why I have to say, Deputy Presiding Officer, I shudder a little bit, maybe only a little bit, but I shudder, shudder a little bit when the Cabinet Secretary says in his foreword to the Enterprise and Skills Review that we need to be, and I quote him, cost effective. It's a phrase, of course, which he has used before. When he was the Transport Minister in 2014, he described Abelio as the least expensive but most cost effective bid to take over ScotRail. Well, I don't think many of Scotland's passengers facing delay upon delay, day in and day out, would agree that this kind of cost effective approach is the right one for Scotland's enterprise, education and skills agencies. I'll give way, of course. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, it would be useful if uh, Richard Leonard, first of all, thank him for taking the intervention, would acknowledge the fact that we had to franchise rail services because the Labour Party yeah. insisted in the two railway acts for which they were responsible Correct. that we had to franchise those. And in relation to cost effective, will he also recognise, when he talks about 2007, that the manifesto on which his party stood in 2007 with Jack McConnell was more money for education everywhere else would have to cut their cloth. There were cuts coming from the Labour Party in 2007 for enterprise support. Mr Leonard. Um, well, um, I wasn't around in 2007. I don't know what Jack McConnell's draft budget plans were, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, but, what I can t but what I can tell you is this. In the teeth of the economic crisis that we've been facing for the last five years, surely the right thing to do is to put more money into economic development, not take it out of economic uh, development. So we should be building up, not talk, taking down uh, Scottish Enterprises' industrial knowledge base. We should be building up, not taking down its strategic role, whilst recognise the importance of sub-national structures like City Deal and the challenges now facing not just the south of Scotland, but the northeast of Scotland as well. And so we argue that we should be establishing proactive sectoral advisory groups in place of reactive task forces that bring together trade unions and employers to help inform that industrial policy making and the real investment strategy that we need uh, to go with it. So let me finish with this. Just as we support the government in its call, and I quote, for the robust evaluation of activity and impact of our enterprise and skills support agencies, I, in turn, I hope that the government will support us in our call for Audit Scotland's recommendations to be adopted so that the Scottish Government itself sets out its own economic action plan, its own clear targets and timescales, and is prepared to set out progress against its own stated economic priorities. That would be real progress. I hope that's progress we can make this afternoon. I move the Labour amendment to the Government motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now move to open debate because I've allowed extra time to all the front benchers for interventions. I regret, but it's now tight six minutes for backbenchers. Uh, can't have it both ways. So uh, I call Claire Adamson, be followed by Jamie Green. Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I'm delighted to um, be called to deb debate um, this um, motion this afternoon in relation to the skills review. Um, I don't know if Mr Leonard was around in 2007. I thought he was here in 2016 when this government stepped in to save the steel manufacturing plants in an area he represents, as I do, securing manufacturing, securing those um, uh, skills for the future and stepping in and, and, and being active in actually working towards securing an economic future um, for our area and for Scotland. And that's exactly the type of um, work that they have been doing and will continue to do on behalf of the people of Scotland. And I, for one, and my constituents welcome that very much. Um, if I could just look a little bit to um, the area of where, where I used to work in the, in the IT industry and some of the challenges facing the IT, IT industry and, and some of the work the government has been doing in this area this afternoon. Um, as outlined in the SNP manifesto, the SNP government has uh, agreed to develop and implement a Scottish STEM strategy to ensure that the, from the earliest stage, children are alive to the opportunities that science and technology, engineering and maths can offer them. And as part of this, they will introduce a new skills qualification that recognises the achievement of a wide range of vocational and other qualifications taken by young people in the senior school. And the SNP government has also agreed to examine the feasibility of further establishing skills academies to address key skills shortages based in the widely 
welcomed um, areas such as the Code Clan model, which um, takes um, young people and trains them in, in coding um, from areas um, not traditionally from the IT area and through the academic world, but um, looks to people's aptitude in this area and offers them training um, to, to go forward. And also in the programme for government, the Scottish Government has said it will launch a consultation on the youth STEM strategy and will set out actions that, um, that will take to raise the levels of STEM enthusiasm, particularly in young people, and also look at maths and numeracy skills in our schools. And this is all really very important because the, the potential economic benefits to Scotland of, of a strong IT um, and innovation uh, economy uh, uh, are, are widely known and recognised and uh, we know that with the rapid pace of technology changing it means there's a strong understanding of the capability that we need to continue to rise this as, uh, raise this as a business priority. Um, the British Computer Society recently published research to show that the number of people required in IT and digital roles will have increased at a rate of five times faster than in other industries by 20 20, and I think this is an area where the Scottish Government has shown commitment but its support of Codebase and other uh, organisations such that and will continue to do so. Um, the BCS has also recently um, uh, reacted to the Brexit situation uh, and said that vital support is required for a science and engineering education and research ecosystem if we continue to succeed in a global economy following the vote to leave the EU. And I think this is hugely important that we cannot ignore Brexit. We cannot pretend Brexit is not going to happen. And we cannot uh, sort of downplay what a devastating impact that this could have on our economy if we don't get the right um, deal in place for Scotland going forward. Um, we have um, the BCS in this um, research has six asks um, of um, both UK governments, of the Scottish Government and the UK Government, and how they can um, ensure that the IT industry goes forward and that the, the IT industry is supported. And one of them is um, to do with outstanding computing education from primary school through university level. And so that our economy and society is a homegrown talent, it needs to compete internationally, um, um, which draws me to the attention of um, further work that the Scottish Government has done indeed in this area with the launch of the Barefoot um, Computing Science Programme. This is um, a, a programme which is done in conjunction with um, BT and in part partnership with the BCS of whom I am mem a member and it, it makes available to um, primary schools resources and lesson plans in, in the IT area. And um, Brendan Dick, Director of BT Scotland said that through, through it, yes, certainly, on the uh, pardon, availability. Just, sorry, I have to call you first. It's a bit of a protocol here. <laughs> Dean Locker. Th please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, just on the, the question of computer uh, science teachers, there, there is a shortage across 17 local authorities in Scotland uh, which don't have dedicated computer science teachers. Is that not a concern that um, in terms of skills uh, development going forward, is that not a concern the government should be focusing on? I'm going to say this before you respond, Ms Adamson. Interventions must be short, nippy, because we're running out of time. Don't okay. mind them, but they must be short. Claire Adamson, please. Well, I'm sure uh, this IT skill shortage is in all areas, not just in education, and that's one of the reasons why we have to be working with our young people and encouraging more people to come forward to have a career in IT at any level. And I think that, um, as, as um, Brendan Dick, Director of BT, was saying, through our education engagement work, we know that primary school ch children enjoy computer science and that thinking skills they can gain help them in other subjects. And I think this is really important from my point of view, is that when we are educating and we're building on these areas, we want to develop skills that will be lifetime for people. And I think that, you know, the, the analysis and the, and the um, work that's done in teaching people um, computer programming especially gives them life skills that will be of benefit to our economy in the future, which leads me to, uh, I've not got time to go into the other great work that has been done in my area, presiding officer, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, call Jamie Green to be followed by Colin Beattie. Mr Green, please. <coughs> Deputy presiding officer, thank you. Uh, I'm very glad that the uh, Cabinet Secretary mentioned uh, digital skills in his speech today uh, because as many as one million Scots face social inequality because of digital exclusion, according to the Carnegie UK Trust. And the growing digital divide between those 
with internet access and those without is felt most acutely in Scotland's remote and rural areas with far-reaching social and economic consequences. Uh, mobile internet and cloud technology have changed just about everything we do, not just making our lives easier, but changing the conditions in which businesses thrive and workers succeed. And in the age of the, age of the uh, digital nomad, connectivity, training and startup support is needed in rural and urban areas alike. Cloud computing has, for some, made the need for expensive inner city sit, uh, office space obsolete. Now anyone can run a global business from their laptop. And this presents all of Scotland with countless new economic opportunities in emerging markets, from consumer analytics through to mobile advertising, for example. But only if our digital infrastructure, our education system and skills training keeps up with global trends. And since my election, I've had the great pleasure of meeting some great young entrepreneurs in Scotland, such as the Superjam founder, Fraser Doherty. And he told me that one of his biggest challenges is recruiting people with the software skills that his business needs. He recruits from across the world because there simply aren't enough programmers in Scotland. The digital revolution began a long time ago, but the Scottish government has been slow to catch on content instead with launching glossy recruitment campaigns and telling it, its agencies to innovate. And yesterday's Enterprise and Skills Review is a prime example of this. This document is full of jargon and words like streamline and step change, but fails to provide any glimpse of a strategy that will see Scotland benefit from the economic opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution. Reading this report, it seems that the Scottish Government is simply stalling for time rather than spelling out the practical steps that they need to take. This document talks about innovation, and I quote from it. We want Scotland to be a place where innovation is an intrinsic part of our culture, our society and our economy. Yet, one of my constituents came to a surgery recently and told me that he's perpetually frustrated by the government's lack of support in helping inventors, for example, in Scotland. This document talks about skills provision, but how can we raise up a workforce of tomorrow when 17% of Scottish schools have no computing specialist whatsoever, and 30% of Scots still lack basic digital skills? My colleague referred to the lack of computing science teachers in Scotland. This is a really important matter. How can we attract new businesses I will. Claire Adamson. Uh, um, thank you for taking the intervention, but the member not recognised that far from not recognising some of these problems, the Scottish Government has been addressing them. Indeed, the, the willingness to, to have STEM in, advanced STEM ambassador programme, work with partners, bring other people in, is all, all working Short, in that Shorten area. the pay, please. Shorten the pay. Mr Question. Green. I take on board the point uh, that STEM subjects are important. However, a lack of computing teachers in Scotland has an immediate effect on skills available to employers. How can we attract new businesses to the rural communities when they are often the last communities to benefit from the rollout of high-speed broadband? Audit Scotland's recent report highlighted the lack of measurable targets and clear strategies set by the Scottish Government for its agencies. The report emphasised that it's not always possible to measure how they contribute to the delivery of the government's overall strategy. Meanwhile, the tech and startup scenes in other small countries like Portugal, like Israel, like Estonia, are gathering momentum. Presiding officer, our amendment today calls on the Scottish government to develop a clearer plan. And I hope that phase two of this review does just that. The Scottish government's lethargy in bringing Scottish enterprise and skills into the 21st century is a bit like watching the sand in an hourglass slip away. Every grain is a missed opportunity. 2020 is just around the corner. Now, I don't want to have to make the speech again over the course of this parliament, but having read this report, I fear I may have to do just that. Excellent, made up some time. Thank you very much. Colin Beattie, followed by Colin Smith. Mr Beattie, please. Presiding officer, 
In these uncertain times, it is more crucial than ever that the Scottish Government remain wholly committed to investing in and developing a strong, sustainable economy, committed to increasing business-driven innovation and our international competitiveness while reducing inequality. For these reasons, I am pleased to see the official results of the Government's end-to-end -end review of the enterprise and skill bodies, which, based on the consultations that have already taken place, promises an increasingly bright future for Scotland and its people. I think everybody in the Chamber might agree with me when I say that we are fortunate indeed that this review was planned before the EU referendum took place. This allowed us to focus efforts not only on pre-existing challenges within enterprise and skill agencies, but specifically on the new context and emerging challenges that have resulted from the referendum. That being said, there are clear areas where we have already made great strides forward, areas where I know we will continue to progress as a result of this assessment. For example, the creation of new Scotland-wide statutory board to coordinate the activities of HIE and SE, including SDI, SDS and the SFC, promises to make the actions of each of these organisations more effective and efficient. In addition to the report released today, uh, sorry, yesterday, I have read through a large portion of the responses to the Government's formal call for evidence and the learning journey workshops and interviews that were commissioned. And there were many, many constructive suggestions arising from first-hand experiences with Skills Development Scotland and the various other agencies. These insights will allow us to continue to build on what we already know works well inside these agencies and will help us to achieve the step change needed in Scotland's economic performance. From what I have seen before and during this evaluation, we have done a very good job identifying areas where we need to improve our performance and then, in targeting these areas, Using the results of this end-to-end -end review, we will be able to hone those approaches to skills development which have been successful, and we will be able to develop new strategies to combat developing challenges in the sector, especially those currently arising from Brexit. There is a clear correlation established between the amount a country invests in research and development and the subsequent success of that country's economy. Historically, Scotland has lagged behind in the amount that private businesses invested in R&D, However, we have increased our expenditure on R&D by 44 per cent between 2007 and 2014, from 629 million to 905 million, and that's compared with a 10 per cent increase in the UK. Scotland's already got one of the highest rates of spend on higher education, research and development in the OECD. What's more, we've increased our international exports by over 17 per cent since 2010, with over £27 billion in exports every year. Total food and drink manufacturing exports increased by 3.4 billion, an increase of 63 per cent between 2002 and 2014. And these accomplishments, in addition to increases in investment in higher education, international recognition of our universities as being among the best in the world, and rankings that place Scotland among the most attractive locations for inward investment in the UK. And I think the point here is we know what we need to do on a national level, as set out by the four eyes in Scotland's economic strategy investment, innovation, inclusive growth and internationalisation. And it's happening right now. Through the process of this review, what we can continue to improve locally on a user level, better coordinating enterprise and skills organisations, and we're committed to using these findings right away. In essence, we're leveraging all of our devolved powers to improve each aspect of Scotland's economy from the inside out. And this even includes those parts of our economy that are already outperforming international benchmarks. The Scottish Government introduced the most competitive business rate scheme in the UK, investing billions of pounds in Scotland's infrastructure, established a curriculum of excellence in our schools and expanded the level of funded childcare to help those with young children participate more fully in the labour market. They have committed to creating tens of thousands of new modern apprenticeships every year, established a new innovation forum and built the Scottish Business Development Bank from the ground up. The actions outlined in yesterday's report promise more of the same success. The focus here is not only on economic growth, as I've been discussing earlier, but on reducing inequality. Inequality hampers the skills development of disadvantaged individuals, reducing their social mobility and undermining any further educational opportunities they might have. And even though we have a highly skilled workforce and a long-standing reputation for innovation, international experience demonstrates that taking our country to the next level to the highest quartile also requires performing better on measures of equality and well-being. In a sense, the two are symbiotic. 
I am pleased to see that the report in phase one spent a considerable amount of effort specifically addressing the inequalities in educational outcomes. This improves employment opportunities and living standards for individuals, but also the overall skills for Scotland's workforce. The Government's report points out that we are one of the first countries in the OECD to put inclusive growth at the heart of our economic strategy, while also focusing on increased competitiveness that can only make for a stronger Scotland. However, I'm deeply concerned, and I see the Government agrees in the report, that our long-term economic performance depends on greater success in international markets and in continuing to attract stronger investment from abroad. And obviously this depends on us maintaining access to these markets, access currently being threatened. The recent events stemming from the EU referendum put the future expansion of our budgeting international trade at considerable risk. I look forward to seeing the actions that are reported in phase one being implemented and commend those involved in producing yesterday's report on their excellent work. I call on Colin Smith to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest and in the fact I'm a councillor in Dumfries and Galloway where I chair the Economy Committee and I also chair the South of Scotland Alliance. As the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening speech, our enterprise and skills agencies do make an important contribution to our economy and the impact on all our constituencies. Last week alone, I met with a company in my constituency, our account managed by Scottish Enterprise. I spoke with young people on a training programme provided by Skills Development Scotland and I visited Dumfries and Galloway College funded by the Scottish Funding Council. But the more organisations I speak to, the more companies I visit, the more the need for change becomes apparent. That's why this review of our agencies is so important and is one I very much welcome. Put simply, the current structures are not delivering the support needed for the economic success we all want to see, no more so than in my own South Scotland region. The government motion talks about the economic challenges that will be caused by Brexit, and I'm not a, a Brexit denier, so I don't disagree. But I can tell members the South of Scotland doesn't need to wait until Brexit to face major economic challenges. Those challenges are there right now. In Dumfries and Galloway, economic productivity, or GVA per hour, is just 82% of the Scottish average. There are fewer people in the region's workforce with high-level qualifications than the Scottish average. Only around 20% of the workforce are educated to degree level compared to a Scottish average of 30%. The proportion of people of working age in Dumfries and Galloway with no qualifications is twice the level of the Highlands and Islands. Youth unemployment in the region is almost always higher than the national average, and there's real evidence of growing underemployment. Not surprisingly, given that the high level of part-time employment, Dumfries and Galloway is a low-wage economy, shamefully the lowest paid in Scotland. The most recent ONS figures show that the gross average weekly wage of someone living in Dumfries and Galloway is £463, compared to a Scottish average of 527 and a UK average of 530. The Government have had a commitment to what they call regional equity, but now call regional cohesion, in their past two economic strategies. But after nine years, the stark figures I've highlighted show that the people of South Scotland don't feel a great deal of regional equity. As Audit Scotland pointed out in their recent reports supporting Scotland's economic growth, there's a real disconnect between the government's economic strategy and aims and the remit and direction given by government to agencies such as Scottish Enterprise or Skills Development Scotland. So what needs to change? Well, we need a clear commitment in this review that regional equity will be part of the remit of our government agencies. And we need a performance framework that not only measures the delivery of regional equity, but also the contribution made to it by government agencies. As far as the south of Scotland is concerned, that can be partly achieved either by a stronger regional approach through existing organisations, through devolving more economic development powers and resources to local councils, or through the establishment of a specific organisation in the area to tackle these challenges. As the Cabinet Secretary confirmed in his opening speech, phase one of the review proposes the latter option. The proposal we outlined of a south of Scotland body does send a signal that the Scottish Government is now at least aware of the significant economic challenges facing the area and the campaigning and lobbying many of us in the region have done for many years is beginning to pay off. But the question is what will the proposal mean in practice? The remit resources and capacity of Highlands and Islands Enterprise demonstrates an effective approach for delivering strategic economic development in a rural area that those of us living in the south of Scotland have looked upon with envy for some time, not least the social development element of HIE's role. However, it's not entirely clear from the list of actions from phase one of the review if that's what's actually proposed for the south of Scotland. The actions talk about a new vehicle to meet the enterprise and skills needs of the south of Scotland, 
but I note that it is a vehicle that will be accountable to the new Scotland-wide statutory board rather than a board based in the south of Scotland, in contrast to HIE, which is very much directed in the Highlands and Islands. It is also not clear what the boundaries will be or what the powers of the new, the new vehicle will actually have. Will it have powers devolved to it from Scottish Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland or simply seek to remove powers from local authorities, raising further concerns about more centralisation? It is not clear what the budget will be of this new vehicle. As Richard Leonard highlighted earlier in his opening statement, the combined spending of Scottish Enterprise and HIE has been decreasing in real terms in recent years. Now, the Scottish Enterprise budget in 2015-16 was £280 million to deliver economic development across 4.8 million people, an average of £58 per person. The final outturn budget for Highlands and Islands Enterprise was £96 million to deliver across a population of roughly 450,000, an average of £213 per person. Now, will this new vehicle for the south of Scotland have a budget akin to Highlands and Islands Enterprise or one similar to Scottish Enterprise? How will this new vehicle fit with the Emerging Borderlands Initiative, which brings together Scottish Borders Council, Dumfries and Galloway Council, and the councils across the north of England, and was launched by the Scottish Government in 2013? Will the new vehicle take into account the significant work that has been done to develop an alternative not to proposal for European funding, which won't happen now as a result of Brexit, but the arguments are still strong and are still there? I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary is likely to tell me this will all come up in the wash, which is phase two. So I hope when summing up today, the Minister will outline in, a more, in more detail the process that will actually be followed to develop the emergent actions from phase one. And crucially, what exactly are the timescales that are there for the completion of this work? The clock is ticking when it comes to economic challenges being faced by my constituents. I hope we won't have to wait too long for an economic strategy that at long last delivers real regional equity for the people of South Scotland. Willie Rennie, followed by Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I think we can all agree, probably bar a few Conservatives who now wish to deny it, but that the exit from the European Union will have a significant impact on our economy, which is essential, therefore, that we have robust enterprise structures to support and meet that challenge. Um, I think we need to make sure that we face off the immediate challenges that we're facing over Brexit, the first of which has been the change in the value of the pound, which is having a direct impact on our economy, some positive aspects, but some serious negative impacts too. Um, but we also need to think about the longer investment decisions that are about to be made by companies right across the country, which again is why we need robust structures to support and advise these companies as they attempt to address those challenges. Um, the motion today does address uh, and does mention um, equality and well-being. And I, I actually recall Colin Beattie also talking about inequality. But again, the, the rhetoric doesn't really match with the action. I have raised on a number of occasions uh, my concerns about the receipt of government grants for companies like Amazon who pay below the living wage. And although there is some oblique reference in the report um, yesterday, there is no direct proposal um, which would lead to the refusal of grants to companies like Amazon for paying below the living wage. Now, I hope this comes in the later report um, because the last time I raised it in this chamber with the First Minister, she said she would take firm action. And I think the firm action was that she sent Rosanna Cunningham off to see Amazon uh, to have a cup of tea. And th that cup of tea resulted in them recruiting um, lots of more workers at Amazon also paid below the living wage. So I don't think we should send Rosanna Cunningham to Amazon anymore if that is the action that we're going to receive. Threats of cups of tea with Rosanna Cunningham are clearly not enough uh, for Amazon to take uh, firmer action. But I would like to see the government institute a rule which says that they will not pay regional selective assistance or government enterprise grants to companies who do not pay the proper living wage as advocated by the government. That would then, I think, match rhetoric with action. Um, the second area, and the Minister will forgive me for being sceptical about this, because I think he gave part of it away when he talked about reviewing the functions of the various agencies um, in the next report. Um, he said that Highlands and Islands Enterprise 
will remain. He said there will be a new agency, he called it, not just a vehicle, but an agency for the south of Scotland, but then proceeded to say, well, we're not actually sure what they're going to do. We're going to review the functions in the next report. So forgive me for being sceptical, because we know this government's track record. We know it wants to regionalise education uh, governance. We know that it wants um, to change the health boards. We've seen what it's done with the police, and I suspect it wants to do exactly the same with the enterprise agencies. Colin Smith has already alerted us to the fact that this new South of Scotland vehicle or agency will be directly accountable to the national agency. The tendency here from this government is to hoover up powers into the centre, not to recognise local need and variation, but to control things from the centre. That is the tendency. And I suspect if the alarm bells were not raised at an earlier stage, we would now be seeing the end of Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And thank goodness that somebody had the gumption to raise concerns about the government's proposals on that, because it would have been a backward step if they had abolished Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So I want to see the government come forward with serious proposals in the next stage of its report to properly devolve powers right down into these agencies. I just don't want to see Highlands and Islands Enterprise remaining with the same powers. I want it to have more powers. I want the south of Scotland to have real, meaningful enterprise powers. And it is ironic that nine years after this government abolished support for the south of Scotland, that it's trying to create a virtue out of recreating something that it only abolished a few years ago, certainly. Keith Brown. Can I thank Willie Rennie for taking intervention? I wonder if you'd like to comment on the track record of the Liberal Democrats when they were in control in Scotland and they didn't create the agencies or the additional powers that he's talking about and massively ring-fenced the expenditure which local government could spend. It seems that like he's saying one thing now, but he didn't say that back in the day. Willie look, Rennie. Look, just because this government removed ring-fencing from local government doesn't absolve it of all responsibility and action of centralised ever, ever since. That seems to be the argument from this government. This party has got a very strong record. We have, in fact, advocated that we should be creating regional development banks in local areas to make sure that we can drive local economies at a local basis, working properly in partnership with local councils. I'm afraid this government cannot wipe away its record of the last few years. It cannot simply try to create a virtue of something that it abolished only a few years ago. But if it does want to praise the record of the Liberal Democrats, perhaps it could praise the work of Danny Alexander, who led the way on creating the city deals in places like Glasgow and Aberdeen and Inverness. And they scoff, but the reality was that Danny Alexander was the leader, the pioneer in creating those city deals. He drove it forward against a rather reluctant SNP government's wishes. At the time, they were just dragged to the table rather than being active participants in it. And I now want to see those city deals being meaningful city deals, because that is the way that we can drive real change in the cities across Scotland. Thank you. Ivan McKee to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you. Presiding officer, the success of Scotland's economy and hence our ability to fund high quality public services now and in the future will depend on the ability of our businesses to survive and thrive both at home and in export markets around the world. Government undoubtedly has a key role to play in supporting that success. The market on its own can only do so much. Getting the form and the focus of that government support right is critical to economic success to inclusive growth and to fostering innovation and entrepreneurialism and to enabling us to build the kind of society we all want to see. I therefore welcome the government's review of enterprise agencies, considering how best to align the various organisations that currently occupy that space to ensure the most effective, efficient and flexible support for business growth. And it's important that we do not set our sights too low. I've spoken in this chamber in the past about ambition the ambition of our young people, of our communities, and our national ambition for this country. Scotland has many inherent strengths in our natural resources and our human talent that many countries can only dream of. In so many sectors, we're extremely well placed to deliver now and in the economies of the future. The task of government through its agencies is to support Scotland's businesses to deliver on that potential, to realise that ambition. And by setting a national target of achieving top quarter OECD states in productivity, equality, well-being and sustainability, the Scottish Government shares those ambitions. 
I welcome the fact that the review process has been broad and wide-ranging, taking evidence from more than 300 businesses, organisations and individuals. And I welcome that the review is proceeding in phases, allowing the structure to take shape, built on a solid foundation, following dialogue with business. In the business world, changes are constant. Continuous improvement of the structures and processes we use to deliver and perform is crucial to ongoing success in an ever-changing world. I also welcome the flexibility of recognising the dif different strengths and support needs of different parts of the country, of the need to align national and local government support and private sector talents. The creation of an agency focused on the south of Scotland is an important step in that direction. It is, however, also right that an overarching strategic view is maintained at a national level to leverage scale and coordinate progress both at home and internationally. Scotland has many sectors that can deliver on a world stage. Renewables, offshore, whisky, life sciences, tourism, creative industries, financial services, premium food, all with the potential to deliver significant export growth for Scotland. And exporting is crucial for Scotland. Exploring and exploiting global markets is essential, but often challenging. The role of government agencies is probably even more important here than elsewhere. For small and medium-sized businesses, making the leap to international markets can be daunting. Soft support, practical advice and opening doors can make all the difference. Phase two of the review must have a clear perspective on how best to deliver this. Drawing on international success stories and leveraging all the skills and talents we have as a nation. Breaking down barriers and building collaboration. Utilising all the levers at our disposal, including existing export businesses, cultural links, political visits, the Global Scott Network, the great international work of our universities and colleges and the soft power of Brand Scotland to maximise international trade opportunities. The creation of the recently announced Board of Trade will be a key component of this work. But, all, but it also has to be recognised that this needs to be about working with businesses at all levels, making the global connections that exist already available to support all export growth initiatives and not just focusing on a few large companies. A coherent structure of interlocking metrics feeding into the national performance framework will be critical to ensure the success of business support and economic development. Few nations are as advanced as Scotland in the use of performance framework methodology, but in comparison with best in class for the business world, it is still in the early stages of development. This presents a great opportunity to drive further ongoing improvements in performance. Phase, phase two of the review will ensure data and evaluation functions are developed to support robust evaluation of activity and impact. Finally, the present array of business support available is confusing and it's disparate. It's good that the review highlights this as an area ripe for improvement and outlines steps to enable progress. Businesses are too busy doing what they do best, building and growing, to take the time to shop around the wide variety of services currently on offer. Sure. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Um, I, I absolutely agree. The, um, the landscape for public support for businesses is, is uh, very unclear, but the government's had 10 years to get this right. How much longer uh, does the SNP government need to, to get business support right for the country? Ivan McKee. Well, as I said earlier in my speech, it's an evolving situation and we need to be continually changing, developing and reviewing what's in front of us. And you'll see when phase two comes forward that more significant steps will be made forward in that regard. So simplification of the framework and support system, enabling the principle of no wrong door will be key to ensuring future effectiveness and enabling inclusive growth. Presiding officer, this is a country with great potential. We can be a world beater in so many sectors and we need to get this review right to coordinate and leverage the many opportunities we have a nation, to build on the solid foundations laid by phase one of this review and move forward to refocus the enterprise agencies to deliver ambitious targets for Scotland's businesses, its economy and its people. Jeremy Balfour, followed by James Dornan. President Officer, can I start by agreeing with the words of the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, in his forward to the report, where he said that we can be justifiably proud of our enterprise and skill agencies, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and Scottish Funding Council in helping Scottish businesses to thrive and grow. This achievement is even more impressive when, according to Audit Scotland, the enterprise agencies 
poorly defined objectives have limited their effectiveness. Audit Scotland State, the report recognises that economic growth is complex and concludes that this Scottish Government needs to be clear on how its economic strategy will be implemented. The Scottish economy has been suffering from a sturgeon slowdown, lagging the UK for the last six and a half years. Despite a shallower recession in Scotland, the recovery has been weaker than the UK and economic growth has been lagging behind the UK since 2009. Keith Brown. Can I thank uh, Jeremy Balfour for taking the intervention and on this uh, Sturgeon slowdown uh, slogan that he's developed, does he recognise, as his former colleague Gavin Brown did in this chamber, when he said most of the major levers in relation to the Scottish economy are wielded by the Westminster Government, or does he not? Jeremy Balfour. I think we simply have to look at the way that the economy is affected by yet again more talk about Scottish independence and the total uncertainty that gives to business and to other sectors within the economy. Growth has been mainly driven here in Scotland by construction, historically a volatile sector, although services have been picking up more recently. This contrasts with the rest of the UK economy, which has experienced broader growth across different sectors of the economy. Economic growth is not e evenly spread, sadly, across this country. The north-east of Scotland has grown at over double rate of, Eastern Scot of the East Scotland, and jobs growth have been st stalling in Scotland under the SNP for over a decade. Scotland now lags behind every other UK region on job creation. Data on economic growth and skills shortage pre-Brexit is shockingly bad for Scotland. And the SNP simply cannot hide behind the Brexit decision, which over one million Scots actually voted for. A failure to invest in skill leaves Scotland lagging behind in apprenticeships and business development. Scotland has consistently lagged behind England on apprenticeship starts, and this has happened under this SNP government. In every year in which the SNP has been in government, Scotland has fewer numbers of apprenticeships than in England. And there is a significant skills gap in Scotland. Let me give an example of this. I visited a business uh, development site here in Edinburgh recently, which is looking to build. It had been lying empty for 18 months. I thought perhaps this was due to the council's slowness or perhaps due to other factors. When talking to developer, the only reason the development hadn't started earlier was because there was a lack of apprentices coming out of colleges here in Scotland. We simply could not find local people to do local jobs. And yet, what does this government do? It cuts college places yet again, which means there's fewer people coming out of Scotland with those skills. <laughs> Business confidence is lower here in Scotland and the rest of the UK. We need to deal with these issues quickly. Scotland's economy is suffering from a chronic skills shortage which the SNP have neglected to deal with. This SNP government needs to stop the blame game, stop blaming Westminster. Yet again, the Minister said that in his intervention and, pass, and participate in a smooth and orderly exit from the EU that is in interest not of a few, but in the whole of Scotland. We need to create an environment where business is confident to invest and grow and ensure we have a workforce equipped with the right skill to set out the most for the new opportunities that will face us in the years ahead. I'm very happy to support the amendment in my colleague's name. Now moves to the last of the open speeches, James Dornan. Presiding officer, um, Again, it's like deja vu for yesterday. Uh, just before I move on to uh, what I'd like to say, every, every speech we had yesterday from the Conservative benches mentioned independence. It seems that there's a theme running through everything they say. They're either coming over or they're terrified. Uh, independence, I agree, is coming. But, you know, let's concentrate on the day job for the time being, lads. Uh, as convener of the Education and Skills Committee, I would like to take a moment and speak in the efforts that the committee have done to address the issues of skills uh, so far this term. The committee has done some initial early work in the skills sector, 
We have rightly started by hearing from people with practical experience of training in various disciplines. Members have visited Stirling Community Enterprise in the summer. The visit has highlighted the massive difference training in a discipline can make to someone's life who has previously been unemployed and struggled to find work. Trainees told us that they had felt they were treated with respect and, importantly, that their confidence had increased through the programmes at the enterprise. It was clear that attendance at SCE provided these young men with much more than qualifications. It gave them a life structure. And without this structure, alcohol abuse, crime and imprisonment were mentioned as likely ways in which their life chances would be reduced. I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the committee to, to record the committee's thanks to the trainees and the enterprise staff for such a useful and insightful visit. The committee has also heard from businesses such as Standard Life and their apprenticeship schemes in the STUC, SCDI and Skills Development Scotland. That session highlighted frustrations from business of the lack of information at a UK level on how the apprenticeship levy will function in practice and uncertainty on how all this detail will be ironed out before its introduction in six months' time. The panel had a clear view that the levy should not bring about any great change in existing approaches in Scotland, such as success stories like developing Scotland's young workforce. Instead, new money should be concentrated on the existing programmes that are working effectively. Happily. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wonder if the member would also uh, agree with me that one of the other comments made at that was the importance of making sure that the apprenticeship system, the skills system, uh, became as uh, uh, focused on reskilling as it was on skilling. I, I noticed that's in this report, but would you agree with me that there needs to be a lot more detail in the phase two report on that point? Uh, yes, I, I, would, yeah, I would agree with you, and I think I might be coming on to that later on about the importance of, of, of uh, reskilling. Uh, and although there are many existing programmes that are working well, Scotland must continue to make new efforts in helping young people thrive in science, technology, engineering and mathematics as my colleague Claire Adamson talked about earlier on. STEM education and training is vital for a future economy. But Scotland must equip our young children with the education that is necessary to face environmental and economic challenges in the future. Research suggests that 65% of children in preschool today will work in jobs or careers that don't yet exist. Times are changing and our education must change to help face problems and sustainable resources and to continue economic prosperity. And I know the Scottish Government is clear we will develop and implement a Scottish STEM strategy to ensure that from the earliest age, children are engaged to the opportunities that science, technology, engineering and maths can offer them. Providing quality education is vital to implement these changes in order to help Scotland flourish. We'll also roll out a programme of school STEM clusters and develop a Scottish STEM ambassador network so that by 2020 every Scottish school is working with a STEM partner from the private, public or third sector. And this will enable students to have a first-hand look at the work that's needed to utilise advanced technology for Scotland's benefit. Modern apprenticeships support young people into their careers while meeting industry skill needs. And the Scottish Government's 2016-17 budget supported the continued expansion of modern apprenticeships from 25,000 to 30,000 apprenticeships. It's clear that more needs to be done to improve wider representation in modern apprenticeships, but progress has been made. In 2015-16, there was an increase of females participating in the programme that they, from the previous year by 41%. There was also an increase of starts who had some, some, some form of disability. The proportion of modern apprenticeships starts among those reporting a disability was up by 3.5 percentage points in 2014. In addition, there was an increase in minority ethnic groups participating as well. ME stats among black and ethnic minority groups showed a slight increase. And these statistics, although they're still pretty poor and still need a lot of work to be done on them, do show that the efforts are producing gradual change. However, we must continue providing these programmes to help young people pursue their future careers. Uh, th and there is a recognition that much more should be done. Now, I know the UK government's apprenticeship levy is a, an area of concern for the government. The government have committed to work with employers to develop a distinctly Scottish approach, as I spoke about earlier on. This cannot cut across the good work that Scotland are already doing. The committee had also heard from businesses, I'm sorry, I've already said that, but I, 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 I have a number of, there's a need to be flexible in how we train our youngsters, and there's a number of examples in this, but the one I'd like to select is one in my own constituency of the Newlands Junior College. The college assists young people who are disengaged from education to make a success of their lives and contribute to society. 
It operates on the premise that mainstream schools do not always offer the best learning environment for many young people and do not always inspire or motivate pupils or meet their personal needs. The, colleague, the college is specifically designed with these young people in mind, providing a specialist service for a very specific group of students and it provides intensive and individual support with a focus on voc vocational curriculum that provides a different experience that can re-engage students and set them on the road. Jim McCall, uh, the well-known Glasgow entrepreneur, devised the concept for the college and has a uh, made a, a considerable financial contribution through Clyde Blowers. The college embodies a constructive partnership between the private and public sector for many young people facing long-term exclusions from school. Personal development the, uh, with the college leads to a certificated two-year course and is provided through Skill Force Scotland to develop personal and life skills where mentoring and personal support are key. Now, presiding officer, I think everyone in this chamber would want Scotland to rank in that top quartile. I don't think there's any argument about that. Scotland is served by a vibrant enterprise and skills sector that will greatly assist the Scottish economy to navigate through the uncertainty of Brexit. But I do have to touch on uh, further to my question to the Minister earlier on that, about the concern I have about the long -term skill sort, potential long-term skills shortage if college and university staff are barred from working in Scotland because of the insane behaviour of the Westminster government over Brexit. This can only, if, the, if this impacts on the education system, it can only have a long-term detrimental effect to what it is that we are trying to achieve. The Scottish Government's review is a sensible evaluation that's evidence-based but inclusive and shall ensure that productivity will be woven with the aspirations of our citizens, preferring them for the future Sorry. economic and technical, <laughs> technological challenges that lie ahead in Scotland, and that's why I support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Jordan. That was a very long final sentence. <laughs> We move now to the closing speeches, and I call on Daniel Johnson. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by referring members to my register of interest? I am a shareholder and non-salaried director of a small retail business in Edinburgh. Indeed, it's, I think, my experience of that that convinces me of the importance and urgency of the review into enterprise and skills agencies. Running shops for the last eight years before coming into this place has taught me three important lessons which I think are relevant to the debate today. First is about change. The retail sector, like many sectors, has been going un undergoing fundamental change. Online shopping isn't an optional extra. Every retail business has to do it, and our shops certainly had to adapt, building technology into how we do business. Whether technology, Brexit, or economic shocks, like the collapse in the oil price, our enterprise and skill system needs to prepare and enable change. So we need to make sure that technological change and automation is creating more jobs than it makes obsolete. Second is about innovation, and we cannot limit the scope of innovation just to new businesses or high-tech startups. So I agree with the government's assessment that all businesses have to be digital. Indeed, in my business, we had to move online, but we also needed to get better at using and manipulating data, and we moved all our systems, including our accounting systems, onto the cloud, so we had complete integration between our web store, our till points, and our back office. So skilling up existing businesses is just as important as new tech and startups. Which leads me to my third point, which is about skills. Innovation demands that both companies and employees reskill to react to the shifts that might occur, occur in their sector. As we moved in our business, our systems online, our staff had to become adept at managing stock online as efficiently as they were at, at, at managing the stock on the shop shelves. As technology changes, our skills system needs to be as much about reskilling people who are already in the workforce as it is about skilling up school leavers as they enter the workplace for the first time. So to that end, I welcome the details of the report, which are about focusing on productivity. I welcome the comments that we have to move to a situation where the skill system is as much about reskilling existing uh, uh, people in the workforce as it is about new skills. And I certainly welcome the points about technology. But as I reflect on the document looking at innovation skills, I think that we needed to see more from the stage one document. We needed a clear strategy which could be implemented, but instead I feel that we are left with a review which has the potential to complicate rather than simplify. There's a lack of clear metrics for success, with a little uh, clue in terms of funding. There is no timetable for delivery. There are certainly more questions it raises than it answers. And it's a review which, while admitting that it's only half finished, that there will be a stage two, sets out to start implementation before we have the stage two document. Ultimately, this review does not point to strategic vision and a way to achieve it. Rather, I feel it is something of a muddled half fix with the promise of more reviews. Indeed, I think there's been much discussion 
uh, in the debate this afternoon about the, the Board of Trade, which is a, the overarching board, the single answer to simplification. But let us just look at what the, the implication of that board will be. It will oversee a budget of £2.16 billion. It is the combination of the first, second, third and fifth largest agencies of the Scottish Government by funding. It easily makes it in the top ten of the largest quangos in the UK and has, I think, clear questions uh, for democratic accountability. It certainly has questions about resource. A body of this size and scope and magnitude, we have to ask, where is the money coming for to resource it and to staff it? And I think Tavish Scott was quite right to ask the questions, and I note he's no longer in the chamber, about its relationship with government. Who will this re re board report to? Will they be setting the budgets for the agencies for which they're responsible? Will they have the power of appointment of all the agencies that fall beneath them? Indeed, simplification is important, the report highlights. But so far in the report, all we un understand that the only answer to that simplification is the super quango. And I regret in some ways that the Liberal Democrat am amendment wasn't taken, because I think the language of the super quango is useful in this debate. Unfortunately, we are going to have to wait till phase two, as Colin Smith pointed out, the wash, where we will get the detail. Uh, but frankly, these details are important because matters such as the, uh, uh, the, the, the purpose and scope of the bodies such as the South of Scotland Agency and SDI will all uh, ultimately come out of the detail of this super uh, quango which will be created. I think Jamie Green and Jeremy Balfour and William Rennie were all right to point to the fact that we have little in the way of metrics and we have little in the way of timetable. And whether it's about the steps that we need to take in order to implement it, as Jamie Green pointed out, or actually the goals in terms of how will things such as enforcement of equity, pursuing things like the living wage through uh, the uh, companies which are helped by our agencies, uh, such as Amazon, we really have no answers at the moment. There are three things you need from any strategy. You need metrics. Uh, just a review of them is simply insufficient. We need to understand the resource behind this. We do not understand the funding which lies behind this review, and we, don't, we have no timetable. Without these three things, frankly, we have no strategy. And this is against a context where we know that there has been a 12% cut in enterprise agencies under this SNP Scottish Government. So, presiding officer, I know what the government is going to say for what I've said. They're going to say, don't be so hasty. Just wait. All the answers will come in the phase two document. But that is not good enough. Because, frankly, we don't even know precisely the nature of that phase two. Is it a final report? Or is it merely a consultation for further work? Is it a series of hints and, and a save the date card? So the government is right about one thing. We do need a step change. That is the only way to achieve the top quartile ambitions that they set out. But in order to do that, we need a clear strategy that sets out clear goals. And in place of, but today, in place of objectives and clarity of purpose, we have more questions. Instead of principles for the coordinating agencies, we have the creation of one a large super board with several new agencies beneath it. And instead of, of a timetable, we simply have a request that we wait until we uh, see what is reported in the new year. So we need change, we need innovation, we need skills. But right now, I don't think that we have the plan in, in front of us that tells us how we're going to do that. I call on Liam Kerr. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, I closed a debate for this party, which was principally brought to discuss the Fairer Scotland Action Plan. It's a good document, 100 pages, carefully sectioned headings, detailed methodology, five ambitions by 2030, 50 points to be actioned by the end of this term, and measurements of success. I was looking forward to the Enterprise and Skills Review, having examined, commended, and noted the very clear recommendations in the Audit Scotland report into the enterprise agencies. And then yesterday, I got this, 17 pages of more padding than the NFL game I was at at the weekend. It is just not good enough. It is not good enough that despite Audit Scotland pointing out that the full range of public support for business is not known, and thus there is a risk of duplication and inefficiency, and that the enterprise agencies themselves gave up on trying to establish what all of the funding streams in the public support were, there is no action point that states that anyone has been tasked to actually do this. Daniel Johnson asked, where is the streamlining? I hope it's in the second report. We'll return to that theme. Despite the economic strategy stating that progress will be measured through the national performance framework, 
Audit Scotland pointing out the contribution of the enterprise agencies to the national performance framework is not measured. Again, no acknowledgement of this in the paper, nor any solution. Jamie Green said, the report is heavy on words, but light on substance. Audit Scotland said agencies must have measurable targets, but phase one doesn't. And Willie Rennie, there is no direct recommendation. I hope it's in the second report. There is a theme emerging. It is just not good enough. The paper trumpets that the Scottish economy grew 0.7% in the, in the last year. That figure is 2.1% for the rest of the UK. Keith Brown trumpets the unemployment rate of 4.6%, but ignores that the number of female unemployment claimants has risen in Scotland, but fallen throughout the UK. That the number of women aged 18 to 24 in work across the UK has increased by 2.8%, while falling 4.2% in Scotland. Job growth has stalled for a decade. Scotland's employment rate remains lower than the UK's. It is not good enough, if it's very quick, sir. Keith Brown. I just wonder if whether Liam Kerr would take the opportunity to answer the question which his colleagues have failed to answer. Does he attribute any responsibility for this litany of woe that he's describing to the UK government, which the Tories have said holds the major levers to the Scottish economy? Liam Kerr. It is, of course, the easy answer to always blame Westminster. <laughs> The same question was put at the opening of the debate and the same answer will be given. You have the levers of power, you have the government, you do something about it. And then, don't worry Mr Hepburn, I'm coming to you. This paper proudly talks of beating the target of modern apprenticeships, but as Jeremy Balfour fails to mention in every year that the SNP have been in government, Scotland has had fewer numbers of apprenticeships start per 100,000 of working age population than England. This is a Scotland where 5% of the workforce is deemed to have a skills shortage, where a CBI survey shows 32% of firms in Scotland expect to have difficulty recruiting apprenticeships. And talking of apprenticeships, I hope we'll hear from Mr Hepburn later on, as will James Dornan, who badly needs to get up to speed. As this Parliament knows, the apprenticeship levy comes in next year. The Scottish Government's consultation closed on the 26th of August with business already saying, you've left this too late. And I asked a written question of Jamie Hepburn on the 11th of October. When will you tell business in Scotland what you are doing with the apprenticeship levy? Yesterday, I got my answer. A report of the findings will be published shortly and will inform our response in Scotland, which we will look to provide as quickly as we can. Business cannot work with that, Mr Hepburn. This is happening. Scotland needs action and it needs it now. I do not have time, I'm afraid. I look forward to I'll you. I'll allow you time, I Mr Kerr. I look forward to you, you telling wish. business what this government is going to do in your closing. It is not good enough, but it is not all bad. We are pleased that this report will set up a South of Scotland agency. We are pleased at the Scottish Development International Expansion. We are pleased at the flexible childcare proposals. All things, of course, we called for in our manifesto. And we can help you further. Make sure the funds raised from business will be transparent for the apprenticeship levy and will be reinvested in Scotland for apprenticeships and training, not lost in the general budget. Reinstate a significant number of college places that you've cut. Pull back from making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK. As Dean called for, when he called for specifics in the second report, have the enterprise agencies provide more non-financial support and designate some of the underperforming parts of Scotland as turnaround zones. It is clear that a robust, effective and modern enterprise and skills programme is needed in Scotland and we welcome the steps that this government are taking towards this goal. But the theme coming out of today's debate has to be, it is not good enough. As speaker after speaker after speaker clamored to say, what is happening? What is happening in this phase two? Where are the targets? When are we going to have these things brought in? Even Ivan McKee admits that all the significant stuff is going to be in phase two. Building a strong economy, growing the jobs market, providing more apprenticeship places and linking the worlds of work and academia with strong and measurable aims and desired outcomes must be at the heart of any review of enterprise and skills in Scotland or else it is simply more bluff and bluster 
from a government that is so out of ideas, so short of policy initiatives, it is stealing ours. Yeah, Thank you. Keith Brown, around nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Just to say, I think, in relation to the last contribution that we had in, in relation to the apprenticeship levy, I don't know if the members are actually aware that the UK Government, when it decided upon the apprenticeship levy, didn't tell the Scottish Government, didn't tell the business community, gave no warning to anybody, could answer no questions on it once it was introduced for many months. So perhaps he should look to his own situation. It's also worth saying as well, of course, in Scotland, all of our apprentices are employed, unlike the situation uh, south of the border. Just worth bearing those points in mind, but I should say that the uh, closing remarks, as ever, the very helpful civil service had suggested some notes. One was to thank everybody for the positive contribution, so perhaps we'll dispense uh, with that uh, for the time being. In relation to, I'll try and go through some of the points raised by speakers if I can. Daniel Johnson, I think, started off actually re relatively constructive, and there's a great deal in what he initially had to say, which I would uh, agree with, uh, not least his point about reskilling be just as important about upskilling or skills being put forward in the first place. And um, it, as I say, he made a number of reasonable points, and I hope that some of the points, although he seems to suggest that he knows the statement I'm going to make before I make it, I think some of the questions that he asked will be answered in phase two. I should say that the idea of a phase two is not just one which has been put forward by myself, but has been done so through the Ministerial Review Group and enjoys general support, uh, and that there are good reasons for that. Uh, James Donnan, I think, uh, highlighted the importance of education and skills, and also the, the absolute necessity for freedom of of movement, not least amongst EU nationals, and he's absolutely right in relation to that. I have to say that perhaps Jeremy Balfour's speech, having been in this parliament for nine years, is one of the most truly depressing speeches I've heard in that nine years. An absolute litany of depressing, talking Scotland down. His statement that the economic situation that Scotland finds itself has got nothing to do with Brexit is an appalling abdication of responsibility for the Conservative, the greatest self-harm act in terms of our economy I think we've seen from any government from Westminster, an absolutely appalling contribution. In relation to Ivan McKee's point, at least he talked in complete contrast to the likes of uh, Jeremy Balfour about ambition and about the strengths that we currently have within Scotland. Of course, it's necessary that we have to recognise what we have to do better, but we should also recognise the strengths that we have in order that we can build upon them. In relation to Willie Rennie, well, unfortunately, uh, Willie Rennie, I was a council leader when we had a Liberal Democrat administration here. I remember time after time being told by the Liberal Democrats what we had to spend our money on in local government. It was not a paradise of decentralised, no, not just now, it was not a paradise of decentralised powers in the government. So perhaps the Lib Dems should practice what they preach. And the idea that the city deals are a Lib Dem invention, not one city deal put in place by the Lib Dems during those eight years when they had the chance to do it. So perhaps you Sit down, please, Mr Rennie. It's quite clear that the Cabinet Secretary is not giving way. In relation to the points by uh, Colin Smith, once again, a number of very good points, I think, made by uh, Colin Smith. Um, although I should also say that um, having made those very good points, many of them in relation to uh, what is obviously a, a, a dearly held view in relation to uh, a separate agency in the south of Scotland, he mentioned some of the challenges which are there. Now, I appreciate and understand and accept the Scottish Government has to take some responsibility for that, and we're trying to address some of those challenges. He must accept, as the Tories will not accept, that the UK Government holds the majority of the major levers in the economy and have been in, whether a Conservative Government now or a Labour Government previously, have been in power for a long, lot longer than this uh, Parliament, than this Government. And in addition to that, local authorities, so he's a member of a local authority, has to have a responsibility as well. So there'd be more credibility in, in saying what's been said if there was an acknowledgement of the different actors which are actually involved in local economies. Also, I think a very uh, good speech by uh, Colin Beatty, once again talking about some of the strengths uh, in the system, which I think is very important to do. Uh, Jamie Green, I would say I, I agreed with many of his points in relation to uh, the need for digital inclusion. Uh, I don't think the digital divide is growing. I think there is a digital divide, and we're doing what we can to try and address that, not least in relation to um, infrastructure, where there's a really, I think, ambitious plan uh, in seeking to try and deal with that. I do agree with them how important it is. We have done a great deal of work, in my view, in terms of uh, roads and railways and so on, but the digital highway is very important to people as well. It's sometimes even more crucial. 
Um, I would say in relation to the points that were made by uh, Claire Adamson uh, when she challenged uh, R Richard Leonard's point that he wasn't here in 2007. Well, Richard Leonard spent a lot of his time talking about the track record of this government going back to 2007. So you can't on the one hand say, I'm unaware of the fact that the Labour Party wanted to have deeper cuts than Margaret Thatcher, and at the same time try and criticise the SNP for that point. Uh, yes, I will give way. Richard Leonard. What I was being asked was what was in the mind of Jack McConnell in the lead up to the election of 2007, a, 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 a question I clearly could not answer. Nobody could, I, I, <laughs> nobody could answer the question of what was in the mind of Jack McConnell. And I didn't actually ask that question. I made the point that what was said by the Labour Party in advance of the 2007 election was that every other area apart from education would have to cut its cloth, we'd have to face cuts. At least acknowledge the track record of your own party at the same time as you want to criticise others. I think also Richard uh, Leonard mentioned uh, unemployment. Now, I can't remember a time under the Labour government when we've had unemployment as low as it currently is in Scotland. Perhaps there has been a time, but he could maybe advise me of that. Not in recent years, I can remember. 4.6%. Of course, it's not the answer. It's not the final position. They've got people in terms of structural unemployment for which we have to do more. I accept that point. Whether it's people with disabilities, people that are furthest from the, mar uh, the jobs market, we have to do more. But at least recognise the success. 4.6% unemployment is something that's worth... Uh, shouting about, uh, not trumpeting perhaps, but certainly uh, shouting about. And just to come on into Dean Lockhart's uh, points, uh, he made the, uh, the point about productivity. You cannot have any credibility in asking any of these questions if it's your position, as it seems to be the position of the Conservative Party generally, that there is no role in the Scottish economy for the UK government. Now, at least in the last Parliament, some more aware Conservative members, like Gavin Brown, said the major levers, the major influence in the Scottish economy was a UK government. It retained most of the levers. But what we have here, in addition to Brexit deniers, are people that are trying to say there is no role, there is no responsibility for the Conservative government in relation to the economy of Scotland. It's not a credible role. Perhaps you'll accept now that the UK government has some, credit, has some responsibility in relation to this. Dean Lockhart. I, I would highlight, Mr Brown, in your own paper published yesterday, you say Scotland remains a mid-ranking nation when it comes to innovation performance. The SNP have had 10 years to get this right. You are an innovation denier. When is the SNP going to fix the productivity gap? Keith so, Brown. So once again, the Conservatives are refusing to acknowledge the fact that the UK government has a role in the Scottish economy. You cannot have any credibility in these economic issues the if you won't even you. acknowledge the fact <laughs> that the government that you support has a major role to play in the Scottish economy. So deniers of the fact that the UK government actually has a role. Brexit deniers seeking to take out of the motion before, seeking, seeking to take out of the motion before us any reference to Brexit. And we heard it, we heard it in spades from Jeremy Balfour, where he said there is no impact from Brexit, the decision on Brexit uh, on the current Scottish economy. There is no way you can have any credibility if you do not acknowledge the fact. Well, I can tell you about companies which are letting people go just now. I can tell you about companies where there are individuals looking for the future elsewhere in Scotland. I can tell you about companies which are changing investment plans because of the vote on the EU referendum. I can tell you about people who are very uncertain about their own situation here in Scotland because the UK government refuses to confirm their status as EU citizens here in Scotland. But according to the Conservatives, there is no impact from the vote on the European referendum. That leaves you with virtually no credibility in tackling these issues if you can't acknowledge that fact uh, in the first place. We've also heard mention by both Dean Lockhart and others about Scotland's GDP. Scotland's GB, GDP per head is 2.1% above its pre-recession peak. 2.1% is not good enough. We'd like to see it higher. The UK's is 1.2%. It would have been good had you acknowledged that, had you shown a bit of even-handedness, a bit of balance and a bit of knowledge and self-awareness about the failures of the Conservative government. So the proposals that we have seek to build on the agency's success, the success that we have had so far, which is not good enough, which is why we review these agencies, to ensure the system is focused on a shared purpose with user-led services. A number of questions were raised about Phase 2, which I'm happy to answer. The review itself, Phase 2, will begin on the 1st of November and run until the spring next year. It will build on and develop the inputs 
and relationships established in the first phase to ensure we find the best way of implementing our key decisions from phase one. Uh, I also hope to be supported in that task by the ministerial review group that I set, set up in phase one. I'd like to thank the members uh, for their help and look forward to continue working with them going There's forward. no time, Mr Rennie. Last minute just now. Uh, and from phase two, I am uh, aimed to propose a single aligned delivery plan for the full implementation of each decision. I anticipate that some actions will be prioritised to be delivered quickly, whilst more complex changes will take longer to fully implement. That seems fairly straightforward to me. And the final phase two recommendations are then likely to set out a programme of work to be undertaken over the lifetime of this Parliament. Achieving our ambitions will require a strong, enduring focus and concentrated alignment of services behind our goal. And I look forward, I would hope, to working with other partners and possibly even some other parties across Scotland to achieve this. That concludes the debate on delivering future enterprise and skills support in Scotland, phase one outputs from the Enterprise and Skills Review. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of motion 2106 in the name of Edward Mountain on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on report on the Memorandum of Understanding of Ofcom. And I call on Edward Mountain to speak to and move the motion. Presiding officer, the draft Ofcom Memorandum of Understanding sets out a proposed new relationship to be entered into by the Scottish and UK Government, the Scottish Parliament and the Office of Communications. It is delivered as a result of the Smith Commission Agreement, which states there will be a formal consultative role for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament in setting Ofcom's strategic priorities with respect to their activities in Scotland. The Memorandum of Understanding contains a number of commitments in addition to this consultative role. These include a requirement for Ofcom to appear before the Parliament and for Ofcom to prepare their and lay their report and accounts in front of the Parliament. The Scottish Government will also have powers upon consultation with the Secretary of State to appoint a member of the Ofcom Board. Ofcom will also consult with the Scottish Government in relation to the board appoints to MG Alba and appointments to Communications Communis Consumer Panel. At its meeting on the 28th of September, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Con Committee agreed to produce a report recommending to the Scottish Parliament that it gives its approval to the memorandum. I would urge the members to support the motion in my name on behalf of the committee, noting its report at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of a legislative consent motion. I would ask Fiona Hislop to speak to and move motion 1869 on the Cultural Property Armed Conflicts Bill. Formally moved. Thank you. The question on this motion will also be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 2117 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 2117. Formally moved. Thank you. And no one has asked to speak against the motion. I will put the question to the Chamber. The question is that we agree motion 2117. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business... Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of four Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move on block motions 2118, 2119, 2124 and 2123 on the approval of SSIs. Thank you. The questions will be put at decision time, to which we now come. The first question is that amendment 2099.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend motion 2099 in the name of Keith Brown on delivering future enterprise and skills support in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We will move to a vote and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 2099.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart is as follows. Yes, 30. No, 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 2099.3 in the name of Richard Leonard, which seeks to amend Motion 2099 in the name of Keith Brown, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. We will move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote in the name of uh, the amendment in the name of Richard Leonard is as follows: Yes, 27; No, 98. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 2099 in the name of Keith Brown on delivering future enterprise and skills support in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Parliament will move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 2099 in the name of Keith Brown is as follows. Yes, 84. No, 35. There were six abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 2106 in the name of Edward Mountain on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on report on the Memorandum of Understanding of Ofcom be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that motion 1869 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the Cultural Property Armed Conflicts Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I propose to ask a single question on Parliamentary Business Bureau motions 2118, 2119, 2124 and 2123. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that motions 2118, 2119, 2124 and 2123 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That concludes decision time. I now allow a short pause while we move to members' business.